Hi, my name is Matt Buffington. I'm a research entomologist with the USDA Systematic Entomology Lab at the U.S. National Museum in downtown D.C. I'm going to be talking today about malaise trapping, how to select a site, how to set one up properly, um, and how to uh, tweak it and tone it so that it stays up for the length of period you're interested in collecting insects. A lot of people set up malaise traps, I think, rather haphazardly. That's why uh, we want to uh, put up a video to kind of demonstrate the best way to do it. There are some best practices. First and foremost is selecting the site. I've selected the site here on the edge of this grass field here. And I've got two trees that are going to be supporting my trap along its axis. Um, I've cleared some of the vegetation here in order to get down to the ground. I suggest uh, malaise trapping is best done with a really big knife. I prefer a bowie knife. A machete works as well. Um, but it, don't be um, shy about modifying the habitat around the trap. It will grow back. Now if you're interested in not modifying the habitat whatsoever for like conservation issues or perhaps there's a manager at the research station you are working in that doesn't want you to modify the habitat, you're going to be constrained a little bit more because what we want to do is intercept insects as they fly from one habitat to another, a so-called flyway. And in order to best catch as much as we can, we want to make that flyway as appealing as possible for insects to fly through. And in this case, uh, behind you, that direction is a stream bed, so there's some riparian habitat that way, and out here is a grass field. There's going to be insects going back and forth between these two habitats, and we hope that our malaise trap is going to intercept them in the process. Uh, so I've already modified the grass. I'm going to take down some of these branches here and prep, prep the site for uh, setting up the trap. Okay, there's several different models of malaise trap available commercially. This one's made by John Hawk. Uh, it's uh, what we call a town style malaise trap in that it's basically a tent-like structure. Insects intercept this center panel. They're trapped up in this roof area that's a lighter color. They're photo Most insects are phototropic, so they'll be attracted and go up. Also, a lot of insects, when they encounter an obstruction, they tend to crawl up, so this takes advantage of that behavior. And they also notice that it's angled, so insects, as they climb up, they're then going to be angled up the central axis to the kill head up there, where then they drop into a, a, an alcohol collection vessel. The hawk trap has a metal bracket at the top that you can insert either a pole into. In this case, I've, I've cut a stick um, that fits in there nicely. And that's going to give it exactly the right axis we need to keep it nice and rigid. The ri rigidity in a malaise trap is absolutely critical. The guidelines, I like to tend to start with getting the main axis guideline set up first, so we're going to tie that one to the tree first, tie this, uh, the, the posterior end to this other tree here, and then we're going to go out to the sides. And each malaise trap is its own kind of engineering enterprise. No real malaise trap ever goes up the same way, because you're kind of conforming to the habitat, aside from the fact that you've modified some of it. So we're going to start tying this up and uh, we'll show you the finished product in a few minutes. Okay, when you get the basic structure of the trap up and you start to see how it's going to be conforming to the landscape, it's important to get the the base, the whole perimeter, in fact, staked really well into the ground. We just use um, tent stakes, which you can get from any store. Some of these traps come with stakes. But these are critical for getting the, the bottom really rigid. And once the, the bottom is staked out, then you can start adjusting the tension on the upper ropes to get it nice and firm. This can be somewhat difficult if you're sampling in sandy areas, which a lot of hymenopters like to do because sand barrens and such can be very interesting habitats for sand nesting insects and their parasitoids. And in those cases, you can use heavy rocks or um, I've used logs before. 
any kind of um, ballast will work. Sandbags work if you've got them. Whatever it takes to keep the bottom of the trap uh, rigid to the ground. So now I can see that I could get some more tension in this main axis. If you look at the center panel here, you can actually see that there's quite a few lines in the fabric itself where the fabric is folding. As I pull it, that fabric comes clear. And that's exactly what we want. We want that central panel, that black panel inside, to be completely taut so that insects can't readily see it. If there's folds in it like that, they can actually see those folds and they can avoid the trap. So what I'm going to do is now adjust this guideline here. It goes to the back of the trap and make sure that axis is really taut. Okay, you can see that's the kind of tension we want right there. The center panel is nice and clear. You can see my gates right through the panel. And that's, a, that's always a good test, actually, if you can see the other person on the other side of the panel very clearly. That is going to be a good indication that you're on the right track with your trap. You can still tweak the bottom here. You can see there's still a couple lines here and we can just adjust on the fly as needed in terms of the tension. We can still adjust the very end one here. So I, I tend to save that one for last. You adjust these two in the middle and you can adjust this one this way and the one on mat sand a little bit that way and eliminate all of these folds in the fabric. Okay, when I first started this corner here, I went to this root down here on the ground to pull this taut, but clearly this is now too low. This is going to preclude a certain number of insects from flying in right here. They're going to shank off this side here. So what I'm going to do is untie this, put an extension rope on this, and go up over this limb right here. Okay, so I've adjusted it. Now you're going to see how this trap just nicely opens up. Look at that. Nice and firm. That's a trap that's going to collect. It's going to collect a lot of insects. I get the malaise trap up and running. I try to get the kill hit on there as quickly as possible because the trap starts working almost immediately. In fact, I can see insects right now up in the kill head, just waiting to be collected. So I typically fill the, the bottle up. You know, it depends on the on the trap. The Santee malaise trap has an almost vertical head to it, so you can fill the bottle up almost the entire way. The um, hawk trap that we have here is slightly angled. You don't want to fill the bottle up with too much alcohol, otherwise as you insert it, it actually spills into the top head and then you've got problems there. And you got alcohol spilling down the inside of the trap, which for that period of time is non-functional. So let's insert that in here. And now this is kind of a shady spot, but if you're collecting like in the desert or in an open area, it sometimes is useful to have some aluminum foil with you to cover the collection head, the receptacle head, not, not this part of the trap here, the, the top part of the collection head, you want always in the daylight because that is where, as long as there's light on that, the insects are gonna be attracted to it. But what you may wanna do is protect the insects once they've been collected. You don't want any more UV on them. You can also slow down the evaporation process on the alcohol. And we just use a little bit of aluminum foil and that just helps protect them a little bit longer, especially if the trap is gonna be out for an extended period of time. And that's really all there is to it. You can rubber band it or duct tape it, whatever you want. You want to be able to just get it off quickly uh, when you're changing the head out. And you can often reuse the same, uh, same uh, aluminum foil each time. So an alternative collection method that is very much in concert with malaise trapping, kind of a similar technique is called flight intercept trapping. And this is typically a panel of fabric stretched between two poles or two trees. Insects encounter this fabric, or sometimes a pane of glass, something they can't see, and when they hit it, they fall down. And you put a, a trough of soapy water or propylene glycol at the bottom of that panel, and things fall in and they drown. Well, you can turn a malaise trap into a flight intercept trap and basically collect everything that comes in and encounters that panel. So what I'm going to do is demonstrate how to turn a malaise trap into an FIT.
That's what flight intercept trap is. First, I'm going to continue modifying the habitat a little bit here. Get it nice and cleared out. And these are um, trays for uh, developing negatives. You can use um, yellow pan traps. We've used um, wallpaper paste tubs, which you can get at a hardware store. They fit in nicely. It doesn't really matter how big they are, as, as, as long as we know we haven't done any statistics on that yet. But these are nice because they're square and they fit in here very, very neatly. And you basically just kind of tuck them in right at the base. Now, if, you're, if, the, if the habitat is uneven, which almost most of the earth is uneven, so you're going to encounter this every single time, you kind of have to fit these in where, where they'll go. And this is where having a good knife or a machete is very helpful. Something like that. Just be sure you don't chop up the malaise trap. What water remains after you've spilled it on the uh, forest floor? This is just typical soapy water, the same stuff that you'd use in a malaise trap. And depending on how often you can afford to service these, fill them up just enough. Sometimes it's they, they can take a lot of water, and you don't want to haul a lot of water into the into the field. If you're near a stream, however, it's easy, obviously, to get as much as you want, but. Depending on the evaporative process going on wherever you are, the desert obviously is going to dry very, very fast. Uh, propane glycol might be more beneficial in that type of application. But here we're just going to use soapy water. Okay, so with these larger trough type pans, uh, one of the nice things you can be able to do is actually slide them underneath the center membrane of the malaise trap, thereby catching things on both sides of the trap. Just like that there. And so you could do that across the entire length of this. Another um, idea given to me by Lubo Masner is to actually stripe the midsection of this panel here with pyrethroid, like, a, like in a zebra fashion. So if things do encounter this membrane, they're more inclined to be knocked down by the pyrethroid into the soapy water instead of fly away. But it also, you want to make sure that you have it about halfway because you're going to have a lot of insects that are going to want to climb up and uh, you'll end up kind of dividing your sample if you're not careful. Now, there's definitely a lot of insects that will not climb up inside of a malaise trap. So doing this down below is actually really critical, especially with coleoptera. A lot of coleoptera are gonna end up down here. A number of flies will end up down here. And a lot of the really tiny egg parasites of um, like the Ceylonid, platygastrids, they'll end up down here too. Uh, a lot of things with reduced wings, um, they do a lot of jumping. They're going to jump, they'll hit this panel and they would typically just jump away. And if this panel is here covered with pyrethroid, they're more inclined to be killed upon contact and fall directly into the soapy water. Now processing these is just like a giant yellow pan trap. You just run it right through a brine shrimp net, wash it with fresh water, then wash it with alcohol, and then put it into either a whirl pack or a jar with, uh, with fresh alcohol after that. Um, and then another possible point of confusion, and this is kind of up to each individual collector, is whether to pool the sample from these with the collection head. Uh, a lot of people like to keep them separate because you're actually um, partially recording ecological data here. And some people may be interested in comparing the trap catch with the head from the trough to see if there's what kind of overlap there is in terms of diversity. Uh, but other people that are maybe pressed for time or pressed for resources, they'll just combine the two because it's a trap, it's a single collection event, pull it all together. That's really up to each individual collector. So I like to keep a malaise trap out for at least three days before changing the head out. Some people change them every single day. Uh, if you can afford that, that's great. If the malaise trap is near your house or near your research station. Um, you typically, in a, in a really good habitat, like this one would definitely fall into that category where there's a lot of insect activity. You want to change that trap out at least once every seven days, maybe every 10 days. 
no more than that. The, and the reason being, the entire bottle will actually fill with arthropods. And if it gets to that point where it's so stuffed, the, the trap stops functioning efficiently. You end up just killing a lot of insects and they build up up in the head here. And they're not scientifically valuable. They're just kind of serious bycatch. And you end up just dumping them away. So, and also um, the more, as insects fill up this bottle, the concentration of alcohol, if you're using alcohol, will decrease with time. And if you want to preserve these insects for DNA extraction, you want to make sure that that, that alcohol stays as high concentration as, as, as possible. Uh, and uh, changing the head out is a big part of that. So we've been running this trap, let's say, for seven days. I've come upon uh, the trap. I'm changing it out. I'm going to put in fresh alcohol here. And it's just a matter of screwing a new one back on. It's that simple. And now I would put a label in there. It would indicate the date range that it was running, its location, maybe its GPS coordinates. Labeling these things in the field is actually very critical. I've had too many instances where I've come back from the field and not remembered my cryptic notes that I put inside the bottle. So having a good data label handwritten and penciled on uh, cardstock or good uh, rag paper is really critical. Okay, you can see the inside of the, the kill head there is where th in, insects and, uh, well, just about everything enters that part of the trap. And they bump around inside that kill head for a while. And if you're using alcohol, the alcohol vapors eventually overcome the insects and they fall out. Now, one of the things about keeping a trap really well maintained is making sure cobwebs stay out of here. Spiders can really make a mess of this part of the trap. And if they get in there and make too many webs, it's really going to reduce your catch. Uh, another aspect to think about in this part of the trap is whether you want to use an excluder to keep uh, macro lepidoptera, maybe big grasshoppers, out of your trap. Some people uh, prefer this, uh, especially the lepidoptera leave a lot of scales. They can really pollute a, a, a trap sample, especially if you're looking for really small critters. Um, but that may actually reduce the overall catch as well. That's something to keep in mind. It's always a cost-benefit analysis with this stuff.